Welcome to In the Name of the Law with your host, Lisa Speaker from Speaker Law Firm. Joining her today is Stephen Sinus from Sinus Dramus Law Firm, Kent Wood of Wood & Associates, PLLC, along with Mary Chartier and Takura Niamfakusa from Chartier Niamfakusa, PLC. Now let's discuss some remarkable stories and real cases. On today's episode of In the Name of the Law, we're going to discuss an intriguing criminal case, the litigation surrounding the new auto no-fault law, and how to qualify for bankruptcy if you're an individual. In the Name of Family Law We're here today to talk about how individuals can qualify for bankruptcy. I have Kent Wood, the lead attorney and owner of Wood & Associates, with offices in Lansing, Grand Rapids and Battle Creek. Yes. Welcome, Kent. Good, good morning. Thank you. So I've, I've heard these terms, chapter this and that, with bankruptcy. Tell me, tell me what we're talking about today. What does that mean? Okay. Well, today we're talking about bankruptcies for individuals. There are four different main types of bankruptcies, but the two that affect individuals directly are Chapter 7 and Chapter 13. Chapter 13 is the idea that here's all your debts. They're wiped away. You can keep some of your stuff, and then you can walk away. You can take about six to nine months for that process. Uh, chapter 13 is more of a, what debts do you have? We set up a payment plan that's anywhere from three years to five years in terms of going through it. If you fall, fall through to the end of that and make all the payments and a few other things, all the other debts are wiped away and you can keep some of your things. Okay, so how does, how does an individual qualify for bankruptcy? I guess probably different tests under each of the chapters? Yeah. So there's a, what's called a means test. And then there's kind of the bright line means test when you're qualifying, they look back and they take the last six months income and they take the average of that. And if you're under a certain amount, you automatically qualify. This amount changes and adjusts every three to four months. Right now in Michigan, uh, if you make 56, under $56,000 as one person, you qualify for bankruptcy. Now, if you have a family of four and your total household income, everybody who's working, you gotta include all their income, is under 103,000, then you, qualify for the bankruptcy protection without having to do anything more. And where does that number 56,000, where, where does that number come from? Well, it's part of the Census Bureau. Uh, it's released by the federal government, every, like I said, every, but roughly every three months or so that uh, for each state, they kind of do an average estimator in terms of what the average cost of all your living expenses are, average income in, and they come up with a number that that is the number for our particular state is. I mean, it seems like a lot of people uh, in Michigan would be under, individually would be under $56,000. Isn't that a lot of people that are filing for bankruptcy or? Yes, yeah, so most of the time people will qualify just because they're under that for the mm -hmm. chapter mm -hmm. seven program. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're slightly above these numbers, you can take a second test where you can disclose actual income, actual expenses, any special issues, and still qualify even though you're over the number, but it's pretty close. I kind of have a 10% rule. So if the number's mm -hmm. 100,000, if you're, you're making 110, you probably still qualify under the means test. If you're making too much more, mm -hmm. that's what kind of says you don't qualify for Chapter 7 and you have to go take a look at what the Chapter 13 plan, plan which is a payback plan. Okay, let's. do we want to talk about Chapter 13 now? Or? Well, okay, yes. Um, so Chapter 13 is a good thing because if you have a lot of equity, right? They let Bankruptcy court will let you keep some things. They'll let you keep so much money in your house, so much money in one car, um, so much money in tools, so much money in clothes. They're not going to take your clothes. Right. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not going to come take the stuff out of your house. They're not really interested in that. Um, but they, you do have to disclose it. Um, but if, if the value of that is exceeds the exemption amount, exceeds what mm -hmm. the, the law, the code allows you to protect, you have to go through Chapter 13. Mm -hmm. Because what it allows is, so if you have a lot of equity in your house, because right now we, live in the, we have this market where people are struggling to pay their bills, but they got really valuable houses. Mm -hmm. And they have this equity that exceeds the exemption amount. And so they have to go to th Chapter 13. Even if they would qualify for Chapter 7 under the rules, they have to go to because Chapter 13. Because they have too much equity in their home. Too, and right. they can't, they could go sell their home, but then they couldn't afford to buy a new one. So right. like, they need to stay where yeah. they are. <laughs> but if you pay off the, cha the, um, the Chapter 13 plan, mm -hmm. you get to keep all that equity. Versus in Chapter 7, you can only keep the exemption amount and the rest has to be paid off. I mean, do you have a, a thought about how not number wise, but like maybe percent are more people filing chapter seven or do more people end up in chapter 13? Well, I believe uh, 
in our office, more people are filing Chapter 7. Okay. Know, I mean, it seems just to be the demographic of clients that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing more and more kind of being on this borderline to have to follow Chapter 13 only because of their home value mm -hmm. um, when they really should use the, be investing in the well, Chapter 7 plan. And when they're going to the bankruptcy court trying to get Chapter 7 eligibility and then how, did the, how does the bankruptcy court know that the house has so much equity? Are they doing an appraisal? Are they? How are they figuring that? Because the, the market's changed so much in the past year and a half. What are they well, judging it by? The, the courts know that there's a lot of expense and they don't want to add more expense to the debt uh, petitioner's issues on top of trying to... So they'll actually, in terms of the, the training, they'll go to uh, websites like Zillow and, and take a look at that. They'll also request the tax, um, uh, what they call it, the state equalized value mm -hmm. of the property to get in, a, use that as a bearing out mm -hmm. uh, what the value of the house is. If your mortgage and stuff and values are all falling within those ranges, they'll kind of, uh, kind of agree that this is the number we're going to work with. Okay. Um, so they, they, I always tell people bankruptcy is not adversarial, meaning the mm -hmm. bankruptcy court's not there to prevent you from getting bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. They're really there to make sure you're following the rules to get mm -hmm. the help you need. So in Chapter 13, the people, the individuals paying their debt, but over time they get to a more manageable payment plan, right? Tell us what happens under Chapter 7. Well, Chapter 7 is you disclose all the debts and whatever is not exempt uh, has to be used to pay off the debts. But then all your creditors get notice, they file proofs of claim, and they get a percentage of the assets that are there, if any. Mm -hmm. um, if done right and kind of some planning in advance, you, there'll be not, little to none in terms of assets there. Mm -hmm. uh, or you'll pay a little bit to get out of a lot of debt. I had one client who paid $10,000 of non-exempt assets, but uh, $270,000 of debt was wiped out. Mm -hmm. That was from a med part medical and part credit cards related to the medical care mm -hmm. around there. Um, so it's a great program. It helps you out, but it can only be done once every uh, seven to eight years. Mm -hmm. And um, so you use it wisely. I always kind of tell people, if you, can p if you think you could pay your bills and not go without the basic needs at home within five years, pay your bills. It's going to be better for your credit score. It's going to be better for loans in your f future because it, once you go through that bankruptcy, there's a delay in terms of being able to kind of move on financially. Um, and you disclose it on, on different applications, right? right. You yeah. disclose it on it, it. Yep, it shows up on your credit report for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, it hurts you for a short period of time, but if you can get back to managing your money and staying on time, you can qualify for a new home loan or refinance within 12 to 15 months after the mm -hmm. end of your bankruptcy, as long as you've been making your payments on time. So if somebody can pay off their debt within five years, maybe bankruptcy is not the right move. So what other things should a person be thinking about when they're trying to decide whether to call a bankruptcy attorney? Well, they should really be looking at their entire debt amount and where it's from. Mm -hmm. um, they also have to look at their where their money's coming from because uh, some money you can't, can't be touched. Social Security can't be touched. So if you're over a certain age and your only income is Social Security and maybe a few hundred dollars from some pension or other thing, bankruptcy may not make sense because they can only collect a certain amount anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but also might make sense just to stop the harassment from creditors. Um, but I always kind of say, take a look at your giant thing. If it's five years, if you can't make, if you can make all the payments in five years, then it may not be time. But if you think it's impossible or going to be difficult or Retirement's looming. Would the Chapter 13 help them make the plan for paying the debts? Yes, they okay. have a specific design plan. Oh. Uh, but one of the major exemptions that are, is there is anything invested in a uh, IRA retirement type account mm -hmm. is totally exempt. Okay. So th they want you to be able to kind of not be a, a dependent on the state, okay. right? Not need that as kind of public assistance after mm -hmm. bankruptcy. So they let mm -hmm. you keep a lot of things in place to prevent that. It's a lot to think about. Thank yes, you, Kent. <laughs> Thank you. In the Name of Family Law is brought to you by Wood & Associates, PLLC. in the name of personal injury law. In previous episodes, we talked about how the 2019 auto no-fault amendments 
for affecting catastrophically injured auto accident survivors across the state of Michigan. Today, we have Steve Sinus, a partner at the Sinus Dreamers Law Firm, with his colleague, Lauren Kizzle, to talk to us about a particular lawsuit that is going to affect these catastrophically injured survivors. Welcome back, Steve, and hello, Lauren. Thanks for having us. So my first question is, uh, what is this lawsuit all about? All right, so the 2019 amendments included some very significant changes uh, that affect the rights of the most catastrophically injured people injured in car accidents. Uh, these changes include reducing the rates of reimbursement to their medical providers by maybe upwards to 45%. Uh, it also includes restrictions on who can provide care for them in the home and be paid for those services. So these are new rules that apply to people going uh, forward, but our lawsuit, which is commonly known as the Ann Dairy lawsuit, has to deal with the issue of whether these new rules apply to people who were injured prior to the effective date of these reforms, which happens to be June 11, 2019. So ultimately, the issue we're fighting for in our case is that the people who were injured prior to the effective date of the reforms were receiving their benefits under policies of insurance that were sold under the old rules and therefore the premiums that the insurance companies charged were based on those old rules. And these people were relying upon their benefits being paid under the old rules. And because of that, we're arguing in our case that those contractual rights remain intact and that what the legislature did in 2019 cannot take away those rights from these people. This is commonly referred to as the retroactivity argument and it's ultimately about whether the legislature can pass a law that takes away the rights of these people that were uh, a part of a contract and, and rights that they were relying upon in receiving their care. And so this is a huge issue. Uh, we filed a lawsuit that included other issues, but this issue, this retroactivity issue, is the prominent issue in that lawsuit. And it's now working its way through the court system, and we want the viewers to better understand that. So that's why I have my colleague Lauren here to help us understand that case. So, so Lauren, can you tell us a little bit about what happened in the trial court of this case? Sure. So our law firm filed our lawsuit uh, a couple of months after the uh, amendments were first passed. We filed our lawsuit in October of 2019 in the Ingham County Circuit Court. Um, in lieu of filing an answer to the lawsuit, the defendants in the case filed what's called a motion to dismiss. Um, so there's extensive briefing on these motions. Uh, defendants filed briefs. We filed briefs. There were se several interested parties who filed what are called amicus briefs um, on behalf of plaintiffs groups such as uh, the Coalition Protecting Auto No Fault, the Brain Injury Association of Michigan, and uh, the Michigan Brain Injury Provider Council all filed amicus briefs in the trial court. Uh, after reviewing all the briefs, uh, the judge held what is called a hearing on the motion to dismiss. Uh, and essentially agreed with the defendant's argument and dismissed the case. And, wow. and then we brought an appeal to the Court of Appeals because we believe that respectfully that the trial court got it wrong in, in deciding that these new rules apply to people injured prior to the effective date of the law. Correct. Right. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what happened or what is happening in the Court of Appeals? Yeah. So... Again, there was extensive briefing done in the Court of Appeals. All of those same amicus groups that I mentioned that filed briefs in the trial court also filed briefs in the Court of Appeals, as well as representatives uh, Julie Brixey and, and the late Andrea Schroeder. They filed an amicus brief as well, uh, which was very significant in this case. Um, essentially, they agreed with our argument saying that they, as the legislators who voted on this bill, did not intend for the amendments to apply retroactively to people who were injured prior to when the amendments were enacted, which is very significant, highly unusual that the legislators would get involved in a case like this. Um, their amicus brief was uh, signed on. Uh, it had a memo of support uh, that was signed on by 73 other legislators um, who agreed you know, with the position that they were taking as well, saying that these amendments were not supposed to apply retroactively. So all of that briefing was all submitted to the Court of Appeals. Uh, we, we had to wait several months to get our oral argument date in the Court of Appeals. And that was actually recently just held on June 7th. 
Uh, it usually does take the Court of Appeals at least a couple of weeks to issue a decision. So that's kind of where we are uh, waiting right now. We're just waiting for the Court of Appeals to issue their decision. We're hoping that it will happen anytime now. The, the oral argument was held by a panel of three judges. Uh, so the decision could be unanimous. Uh, all three judges could agree with either the plaintiff's argument or the defendant's argument, um, or it could be a two to one decision. Um, but regardless of, of what happens, the losing party will likely be appealing to the Michigan Supreme Court. Okay, so the, the case will not be over whenever the Court of Appeals does issue its decision. We are going to expect this to go on a little bit longer. Can you tell us about the Supreme Court process? What's the next step? Sure. So, uh, like I said, the losing party will likely be appealing to the Supreme Court. Um, it's not a guarantee that the Supreme Court will take the case. Uh, you have to apply to appeal to the Supreme Court and, and they have, you know, uh, they get to decide what cases they want to take. Um, so if they do decide to take the case, um, there will be additional briefing done, um, additional, you know, briefing done by both the parties and amicus groups can file briefs again as well. Um, and then there will likely be another oral, oral argument heard um, by all of the justices on the Supreme Court. Um, and then they'll likely issue a decision uh, after that. And one thing I wanted to uh, make a point of is that this issue about these new rules and whether they apply to these people is a real issue for them and their ability to get the care they need. We, we've touched on that in other episodes, bringing people on who've been struggling to get the care they need when these new rules are applied. Another thing to keep in mind is that while the trial court disagreed with us, there have been several other trial courts across Michigan who have basically embrace the arguments that we're making in this case. So you have a split in, in trial courts across Michigan about how this issue of whether these new rules should apply to people who were injured prior to the reforms. And when you have that, you really need the courts to act to bring clarity and certainty to the law. And unfortunately, we're now into this appellate process that is going to take a couple more years to bring that clarity to people. And that's just an unfortunate reality of the situation that's created by these laws. You, you make an excellent point, Steve, about how various courts around the state, trial courts around the state are maybe resolving the question, the same question in different ways. Uh, and I think that makes it even more significant, important for our Supreme Court to weigh in. Whatever the result is in the Court of Appeals, um, it's, it's going to be one of those things that we need to have uniformity in interpreting the law, right? That's what the Supreme Court's there for, in my view. Right, because Lauren and I have this experience uh, almost every day now where we have to tell people when they call us that we don't know what the law is. Nobody knows what the law is when it comes to this issue. And, and apparently are, not 76 legislators who signed it either. So that is that is pretty significant, Lauren, <laughs> like you said. Yeah. Right, people think that the law is there and it's this clear cut thing that you can tell them you know, what their rights are. And now we're just telling people day in, day out, well, your rights are hanging in the balance as the courts decide this major case. And sadly, the appellate process is not fast. And, and I believe your firm did try to make the case go by more quickly. And that attempt was uh, rejected. So you're just on a regular track, just like any other case. Um, and, and then if, once it gets to the Supreme Court, I mean, I would I would predict we wouldn't have any kind of clarity until sometime like a year from now. What do you think? Unfortunately, we agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing this information with us today. In the Name of Personal Injury Law is brought to you by the Sinus Dramus Law Firm. Go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics and to view other In the Name of the Law episodes. In the Name of Criminal Defense. The Select Committee to Investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol has engaged in public hearings. Today, Mary Chartier and Takura Nyapakuzda are going to discuss the committee's purpose, what it has revealed so far, and perhaps a little bit about what to expect in the weeks and the months ahead. Welcome back, Mary and Takora. Thank you, Lisa. Thank so, you. Mary, what is the committee's purpose? The committee's purpose is to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And while there are other agencies that are engaging in the same sort of investigation, and we see that there have been just numerous people charged for that attack. The January 6th committee is a little bit different because they're gathering information from multiple agencies as well as conducting their own investigation to try and understand 
what happened, who knew what, who was involved. It's really been, the hearings are fascinating to watch. Are there any Republicans on the committee? Yes, actually, there are six Democrats and two Republicans, including Liz Cheney, the vice chairwoman, who's the most well known. And other Republicans certainly could have participated, but uh, perhaps not surprisingly declined the opportunity. So I was hoping that the two of you could provide us some of the key takeaways that have come out of the prior hearings. Sure. So I would encourage everyone to, the hearings are actually online, and so people can Google January 6th committee and look and they can actually listen to the hearings. It's compelling. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this in this country really ever. I think the closest would probably be the Watergate hearings, which I know, Takura, you're too young for. And even I was young <laughs> for that, um, right. although I was- I, I was, was barely young. alive. <laughs> I know, me, me too. I mean, I, I was more concerned about crayons probably and, you know, recess than watching the hearings. But we haven't seen- something like that. We haven't seen a president embroiled in this kind of controversy and conflict with allegations of criminal conduct going on where there are hearings. And so a couple of the big takeaways, the first is how many people told former President Trump that he had lost the election. And, and also in the weeks and months leading up to the election, there is evidence that Republicans, people who were involved in his campaign, were telling him the problems that his campaign was having. And so the fact that he lost the election shouldn't have come as a shock because people were telling him that his campaign was in trouble. And it was really interesting to hear from some of the pollsters and hear from some of the people who worked in the campaign because the hearings have live testimony, but they also have snippets of people's videotape deposition testimony, which they gave under oath. And then the committee said they're ultimately going to make the complete testimony of every single person available. And so you hear people say, for example, one of the big problems was former President Trump's position on mail-in voting. He was very anti-mail-in voting, despite the fact that he himself has voted by mail and so has his family, but was very, very adamant about mail-in voting. And so his campaign folks were telling him that was going to be a problem for a number of reasons, including, as everyone remembers, we were in the middle of a pandemic. So when you're telling your, you know, your, the people who are supporting you don't vote by mail, you are eliminating some votes for you. And also it was really interesting to hear from people who talked about that the way that it has historically worked for decades and decades, election after election is someone might, for example, a Republican might be ahead but once they count all the votes, the Republican might lose. And that's not because there's anything funny going on. It's because they're counting legitimate mail-in ballots. And so it was really interesting to hear what people had been telling the president both before and then after the election. I mean, his own attorney general, who he hand-selected and he had a lot of great things to say about, told him that he had investigated every allegation of fraud in, in the people in the Justice Department and the people in various states. And these are predominantly Republicans. And what the president was being told by individuals like Rudy Giuliani and the My Pillow guy that was not being supported by what they had found. And they really dug deep. And, and it was fascinating to hear this from Republicans who are the ones who are predominantly testifying at the hearing. And of course, and we didn't know about any of these things at the time. We, we are just learning about them for the first time with these hearings, right? Well, some things we've known about, right? So we've known that the Justice Department and we've known that Attorney General Barr investigated all allegations of fraud and had discounted that there was any fraud that would have changed the election in any state. And so we, we knew about that, but we haven't heard the level of detail and we haven't heard people just one after the other after the other talking about what they did and the former president's reaction to being told that, okay, we investigated this area and this is what we found. And these are people who were Republicans. These are people who wanted Mr. Trump to win, right? So these are his supporters, and but their loyalty was really to the constitution. And so it, that was really fascinating. And then the other fascinating thing, and you know, Takura, well, I know you want to weigh in, but the other fascinating thing was how involved Mr. Trump was in what he wanted to have happen. So calling people on the phone, telling them to find votes, 
really getting involved in, in that aspect of things. Takura, did you have something to add? Yeah, so uh, Trump and his associates fake election claims unleashed a torrent of vicious threats against election officials and their family. For example, uh, Al Schmidt, the former uh, Republican commissioner of Philadelphia, and I think famously Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, are just a couple of the Republicans who publicly defended the legitimacy of the 2020 vote. And other people who refused to bow to Trump's demands had phone calls, people showing up outside of their house. And uh, the, the Secretary of State on November 11th, after the former president announced his name, he said the threats against his family increased in terms of the belligerence and the frequency. Um, and what we know also is that the system held up, but barely, right? Things could have gone very differently. Elected mm -hmm. officials like Brad Raffensperger and Rusty Bowers, as well as appointed ones, uh, cited their commitment, as we said, to the law over the whims of any one man and to uh, over principles of power. So their valor is hardening for democracy, and we're just thankful that there are people who took their oath seriously. So what does the future hold for our democracy? Well, Congressman Thompson, <laughs> uh, the chairperson, said the conspiracy to thwart the will of the people is not over. The committee's work and the hearings are both an excavation of the past and a warning for the future. What can we do to prevent something like this from happening again? I think people need to take democracy seriously. It's we have so many things going on in our lives. We've got work and families, we've got, you know, hobbies, but I mean, really our country's democracy is we're still a young country when you look at countries around the world. And we take for granted democracy, but we shouldn't. We need to really fiercely protect it. And that means that candidates that we support lose ballot elections. I mean, that's happened to me. I voted for people a lot and they lose. And you just have to take it on the chin and you know go out and vote the next time. I think people need to really vote. They need to encourage their family to vote. Voting matters. We see that with the United States Supreme Court and what's been going on with women's bodies, right? I mean, that is a direct result of who was in the White House and who appointed justices. And people need to engage in critical thinking and look at valid sources for information. I like social media as much as the next person, but that is not a valid source for legitimate information. And Lisa, as you know, we discuss these topics at length as it relates to criminal defense on our podcast, Constitutional Defenders, and we hope people will join us and listen. Definitely and vote listen in, in November. Vote in November. And vote. And vote. <laughs> then vote. Thank vote. you. Vote. Thank you. <laughs> in the Name of Criminal Defense is brought to you by Chartier Niam Fakusa PLC. Thank you for watching In the Name of the Law. See you next week. Thank you for joining us today for In the Name of the Law. Please go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics. And please join us next week for another informative show.